state news scathing comments are front and center. But during the campaign, he vowed to build the wall to keep out killers like those who took the lives of Kate Steinle or Sergeant Brandon Mendoza. From the beginning, President Trump's opinions on this whole issue have been fueled by the stories of those angel families, people who lost their loved ones to killers who had no legal right to be in the country at all. He stood with them on the campaign trail, and he stood with them at his address to Congress. So now that DACA is in danger and they watch all of this, what do they think about all of this? Tonight, one of those for whom it is very personal, Marianne Mendoza, joins me live. Molly Hemingway and Richard Fowler are here to debate. But first, let's go to Chief White House Correspondent John Roberts with the latest. Hi, John. Martha, good evening to you. Let's keep you up to date on what the president is up to. We'll put the pictures up on the screen for you so you can follow along. The president touched down in West Palm Beach, Florida, just a short time ago. Uh, Air Force One touching down after a blinding thunderstorm there uh, in West Palm. And here comes the president out now along with uh, Melania. And he'll spend the weekend at Mar-a-Lago. Uh, Barron there with him as well uh, before heading back to Washington, D.C. for what he hopes will be a much quieter beginning to his week than the end of this week. We're also learning some preliminary details of the president's physical that was conducted this afternoon at Walter Reed Army Medical Center. According to Dr. Ronnie Jackson, who is the White House physician who examined him, the president's physical exam today at Walter Reed National Military Medical Center went exceptionally well. The president is in excellent health, and I look forward to debriefing some of the details on Tuesday. We won't learn everything about the president's health, but we will get a good idea of how he's feeling. Now to the other big story of the day. We can go back to those pictures in West Palm Beach, the, uh, I guess you could call it S-storm, over the president calling uh, several countries around the world from which the United States uh, gets its immigrants S-holes. Uh, it remains to be seen whether or not the president's comments on all of this are going to affect negotiations over the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals Program, which will begin in earnest next week. Of course, the president president had that big uh, meeting here at the White House earlier this week, 22 members of Congress over, where he appeared to earn an awful lot of political capital. One of the big questions now is, uh, has he squandered all of that? Certainly, this has been a distraction today. Watch what happened when the president was signing a proclamation uh, for MLK Day on Monday and uh, got up to, uh, to leave the room and uh, had a bunch of questions shouted at him by the National Press Corps. Listen here. Mr. President, will you give an apology for the statement yesterday? Mr. President, did you refer to African nations? Mr. President, are you a racist? Mr. President, will you respond to these serious questions about your statement, sir? No, Mr. President, I have to allow you. A lot of questions there as to whether the president is a racist. President Trump denies that he ever used the word asshole to describe Haiti and other nations, though he did acknowledge in a tweet that he said Haiti was a poor and troubled country. And while Senator Dick Durbin of Illinois, who was at the meeting, insisted President Trump used that word several times, Senators Tom Cotton and David Perdue, who were also there, say they didn't hear it and released a joint statement to the contrary, saying, quote, we do not recall the president saying these comments specifically. But what he did call out was the imbalance in our current immigration system, which does not protect American workers and our national interest. Now, the real danger for the president here is that he risks losing leverage in the days ahead in his efforts to get what he wants in a DACA deal. This morning, the president very loudly insisted on Twitter that the deal that was brought to him yesterday was no good, that it didn't adequately fund a wall, made chain migration and the lottery system worse. Democrats, though, are going to try to drag this out as long as they can. There's already plans for a censure resolution of the president in Congress. And there are some, uh, there's some talk out there as well that this could increase the chances of a government shutdown on January the 19th, which the Democrats would then try to blame on the president and probably point to this as one of the reasons why. Uh, just when the president got up a huge head of steam of political goodwill, as I mentioned earlier from, from that uh, meeting earlier today, he, he may have just sort of given it all away in a singular moment uh, that, with, with, a, with an ill-timed comment, Martha, that he should have known, given some of the company, would never stay in the room. But of course, all of this is heading not toward the DACA negotiations, not toward the budget negotiations, but toward next November, 
when the Democrats are going to try to give the president some very big coattails and try to drag down Republican candidates across the country. Martha? John Roberts, thank you very much, John, from the White House tonight. So President Trump has stood up for my guest on the campaign trail and during his presidency, too, in efforts to increase border security and crack down on illegal immigrants in this country. Here now, Marianne Mendoza, whose son was murdered by an illegal immigrant. Uh, Marianne, thank you very much for being here tonight. Thank you, Martha. So, Marianne, when you watch all this back and forth and you hear, you know, what the president allegedly said about these countries in terms of the people that are coming here from there. Um, he says he didn't say it the way it was portrayed, and you heard the back and forth about that. And you are someone who has dealt with the ramifications of this on such a, a, a the deepest personal possible level. What do you make of it all? I'm... I'm really getting sick and tired of the politicians in Washington and how they handle themselves. And, um, you know, this whole, I, I think they're trying to deflect away from the DACA issues um, to draw attention away from what's happening and what they aren't accomplishing in Washington. And this isn't just about Sergeant Brandon Mendoza, my precious son, or Kate Steinle. This is about tens of thousands of American citizens who've been killed by illegal repeat criminals who've been released back out onto our streets. It's about hundreds of thousands of victims of illegal alien crime. And we are hearing more and more from these people who are coming out of the shadows. This is a huge problem in our country. And my son is no less important than anybody sitting on Capitol Hill. And this fight has to be what the American people want. This isn't about politicians' wants and needs and their special interests and what they're going to get done and what they're going to gain from how they posture themselves on these laws. This is a straightforward issue that doesn't need anything else attached to it. Every one of you politicians in Washington need to be protecting your fellow Americans. That is it. That is the issue that needs to be handled. What do you think about how the president handled it this week? You know, a lot of a lot of talk was about the bill of love, and that's really all a lot of people heard. But there was plenty of things that he brought forward in those in that meeting that he was expected to be on that. Um, you know, reform that they're bringing through. And he's going to stand firm on his promises from the campaign trail. I don't think he's going to turn his back on any of us who stood up for him and backed him up and, and supported him through this. I believe in him. I see the changes he's made in our country so far. And I have nothing but hopes for what's going to come in the future from him. So there's obviously so much focus on, on the comment that he made, this asshole comment about these countries. You know, the asshole comment, if, if that's going to start making everybody who says asshole a racist, what, what is this country coming to? And why are they focusing so much on that? And why are they not focusing on the positive things that our president is doing? And why aren't these liberal TV media outlets focusing on the, the American victims of illegal alien crime? They will not even talk to us. They want to act like we don't even exist. And guess what? Middle or liberal media, just because you don't acknowledge us and you don't have us on your shows does not mean that we don't exist. We're here, we're hurting, and it's happening more and more every day in America. Marianne, you know, you know what, what may have prompted that the comment or the discussion or wh however it actually came out was that Senator Durbin was arguing that people who are here on temporary, per, temporary status because of, for example, the earthquake that happened in Haiti, the uh, in El Salvador as well, the earthquakes and the hurricanes that brought those people here, they were granted temporary status in the country. And now the president says it's time for them to go back. They're, you know, the infrastructure has been repaired and the things that were promised have, have happened. Um, you know, he, Durbin is pushing for them to be able to stay here. What's your message on that? Uh, Durbin needs to tar start taking care of the homeless veterans we have and the homeless Americans that we have and the hungry American children that are, that are out here on a daily basis. And I think our politicians in Washington have lost focus on what they really are there for, the constitutional rights that every one of us as American citizens have that are being completely ignored. And they are giving more precedent to these illegal criminals. And you know, every one of them are criminals because they're here. This DACA program that the liberals claim uh, have such, you know, they're contributing members of society. 40 or 24 percent of them are illiterate in English. Only 42 percent of them have basic English um, comprehension. And 49 percent of them have not graduated from high school. And there's a huge percentage of them that are on um, welfare programs. What I think our, our politicians need to be doing 
and Mitch McConnell needs to take this to the Senate floor. We need Kate's law passed, and we need No Sanctuary for Criminals Act passed, because both of those things deal with over 900,000 convicted illegal felons who are roaming the streets in America. And our politicians don't care about our safety, and they want to make a big deal about protecting these DACA people. Do what you need to do first. Mitch McConnell, quit throwing this back on angel mom and dads that we need to pressure Trump to get us more airtime in, in order to enable you to bring it to the Senate floor for a vote. And do what you were elected to do. Miriam Mendoza, thank you so much for being with us tonight. We wish you well, uh, and we're sorry for what happened to your family. I know that's, that's not enough, but we really appreciate your thoughts tonight. Thank, thank you. Thank you very thank you much. Thank you so much. So in this debate over the words that have been said, is it all distracting us as Marianne Mendoza is urging everyone to consider from the real underlying issues of the struggles that we face in this country? Here now, Molly Hemingway, senior editor at The Federalist, and Richard Fowler, nationally syndicated radio talk show host, both are Fox News contributors. Um, Marianne Mendoza was very moving. Obviously, this is very personal for her, and she has experienced the worst of it firsthand, Richard. What do you say about what she had to say? And, you know, what's your response of, of the focus in Washington right now? Well, I mean, I'm really sorry for her loss. I mean, it's definitely something to lose a child. I, I don't have a child, so I can't imagine what it is to lose one. And so my heart goes out to her. Uh, but with that being said, I, I think we, we can do both of these things. It's not hard to do both. And I think that's what Senator Dick Durbin from Illinois was trying to do when he presented his deal to the president. Democrats are willing to give on border security, willing to give more money to make sure that the border is secure. But at the same time, we want to make sure that we protect, protect those individuals who came to this country at no fault of their own, who are either in college, have a job, or are serving in our military. And on top of that, we want to make sure that we protect those who have temporary status in the country who are working and contributing to our society. And what the president met that, that deal, deal with? It was temporary. And, we, and what the president met that deal with was with a comment that a lot of people have called racist. People have called it culturally insensitive at best, um, and criticizing these countries that have meant a lot to American history and a lot to global history. And I think that's sad. And I think the president lost a lot of momentum and a lot of ground that he picked up on Tuesday. He squandered it all uh, today. Molly. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not sure if I share Richard's view that uh, Senator Durbin is seeking a deal so much as sabotaging a deal. But I think there's a lot we don't understand about the comments that he leaked. Uh, you know, this, his claim, we're, we're talking about, you know, whether to extend temporary status. The argument of people who want to extend temporary status is that we have to do it, even if it's been 18 years, because we can't send people back to these hell holes where they're from. And yet the people who want to end the temporary status are supposedly referring to these countries as these places that are horrible. <laughs> it doesn't quite make sense. It also doesn't make sense because Donald Trump's big push from our current incoherent immigration policy is to merit-based immigration, where you judge people based on their skills, their education, their language abilities, their chance for success in this country. And of course, that doesn't matter where you come from if you're being judged on merit. So I don't think we have a full understanding of what the president's mm -hmm. comments were. I mean, it's bad language, but it doesn't really match with what his overall policy is. But most importantly, like your first guest said, this is just ridiculous. I mean, people will do anything to keep from talking about our problems with our immigration policy and how to fix it. And it's really getting disgusting for a lot of people to watch. All right. I got to leave it there. Uh, two thing, uh, two, uh, Go ahead, I'll be brief. Two things. One, one, I think the president's comments is part of the problem. And number two, the Statue of Liberty says, bring us your poor, your tired, and your huddle masses. And a merit-based system takes away from what that statue says. So when we go to a merit-based system, let's take that statue down. But just remember, there have been plenty of times over the course of history where we have changed immigration policy where we have halted it for but a period to, of time. But to go to a strictly merit system that we're allowed to is do that absolutely as a country, against Richard. the Statue of Liberty. The it's argument that Richard is making is that everybody in the world system. has... The argument that Richard is making is that everybody in the world has equal right to be in America along with American that's citizens. That's not what I'm saying that at all. That is not true. And that is what, and being what a sovereign country means that's not possible. I'm saying that we should allow the poor and the huddle masses in so they can achieve the American dream just like my parents did. Thanks, that's what guys. I'm saying. I got to go. Thank you very much, Maya and Richard. Good to see you both. So coming up next, with so many House Republicans retiring or seeking higher office, what does it mean for the GOP's chances of keeping their majority in the 2018 midterms? Our power panel on that and why there's so much focus on a little race in Pennsylvania right now. And Tanya Harding back in the spotlight, folks, but things got ugly quickly when she was asked again about Nancy Kerrigan. Hi. 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 So it has been 
quite a week, but there is perhaps no more really pressing issue for this White House in 2018 than keeping majorities in the House and Senate when it comes down to it. These 30 Republicans have said sayonara, at least, to their seat in the House. Democrats only need to take 24 seats to regain control of the House, which, of course, would dramatically change the entire rest of the Trump presidency. Thus, the intense interest in the White House, at the White House in Pennsylvania's 18, District 18, upcoming special election. So everyone's going to be there next week. The president's going, Mike Pence is going, and others. President Trump won that district by 20 points in the election. It should be a very safe area. But after the Alabama experience, there is no desire to repeat that. And the president will head there to support the Republican candidate Rick Saccone over his Democratic opponent, Connor Lamb. So here now, Ned Ryan is the former White House staffer under President George W. Bush, one of them, and a CEO, not the only staffer, there were others, <laughs> uh, CEO of American Majority. And Chris Darwald is Fox News Politics editor, of course. Jessica Tarlov is author of America in the Age of Trump and a Fox News contributor. So, Mr. Starwalt, we begin with you um, because you know every one of these districts and huh. why they are or are not important. Um, so this ought to be a very safe area. But why are they going to be spending so much time there next week? Well, because they want to break the notion. Those retirements you mentioned are a factor, yes, of the fact that uh, the climate looks bad for Republicans. It's going to be a tough year. Probably if the election were held today, they'd lose more than 40 seats, I imagine. Uh, but they want to change that narrative. And the way you change that narrative is say, look, we can win. We can defend these seats. This is not going to be a rat. We're going to fight for you. And the message in Western Pennsylvania is we're going to hold these seats. We're going to hold the line. And it's supposed to telegraph across the country to other Republicans. And do you think they'll be successful? They better be. I, if, they can, <laughs> if, if they can't hold that dadgum seat, they can't hold any. Well, you could have said the same thing about a Senate seat, a certain Senate seat in Alabama. Then nobody... There are no child molesters on the ballot more. this time, right. which I think is a key difference. Yes. Right. There's right. so many differences. So, so between, the, between the child molesters and the, uh, the asshole environment that we're living in, um, <laughs> it's pretty ugly out there. But you know what, Ned, when you sort of peel back the onion and you take a look at what's going on in the country underneath it all... I do wonder whether or not these seats across the country are as vulnerable as people seem to think they are. I, I tend to think, again, we're in January. Uh, November is a lifetime away. You look at the economy. The economy is picking up. I think we could maybe have potentially multiple 4% uh, growth quarters. Uh, we could see a market that hits 27,000. We just saw 150 companies give bonuses, uh, I think, in the neighborhood of $3 billion. People vote with their pocketbooks. And I know that there's this, this theme that people are saying this could be a Democrat wave in 2018. Typically, the party in the White House loses seats. But with all of these things going well in the economy, I'm still confused as to what Democrats are actually running on in 2018. I mean, if the economy is going great and the market is going great, what are they going to run on? Resistance? Impeachment? Hey, put us back in power so we can raise your taxes. So I'm still confused as to what the actual message of Democrats is going to be in 2018. And let's not forget... In the Senate, the Senate map heavily favors Republicans. I actually think Republicans are going to pick up seats in the Senate regardless, and I still think they're going to keep the House uh, in November of 2018. But Jessica, really? if, if they lose the House, there will, they will, you know, they're going to push impeachment proceedings almost immediately, right? I mean, it, well, at least 25 I don't know based on what, but are. that's probably what's going to happen. No, I, I'm not a fan of that approach. I, I don't think it's smart. I don't think it's good messaging also going to an election year. I agree with Ned insofar as that we need messaging based on policy, and I think Democrats need to get that under control. I completely disagree about taking the House back. As you said, we need 24 seats. You already have 30 retirements. I think 18 are seats actually that Hillary Clinton held, and that's why a lot of people like Daryl Issa are actually backing away for, from this, coupled with Republican population popularity and the president's own popularity there. Uh, but to, returning to Pennsylvania's 18th, I don't actually see Connor Lamb winning there already. I think it's a 12-point lead uh, for Saccone. Uh, but what I do think is really interesting is that Connor Lamb came out five days ago and said that he wouldn't support Nancy Pelosi for a leadership position anymore. And I believe that that's going to be a trend, especially for younger Democrats coming up. We've heard a lot about how it's time for a change and that we need younger, new, more progressive leadership. So I think he might be leading the way there, a la Tim Ryan from the leadership challenge uh, last year. So right. that's what I think is important there. We tried on time. Unfortunately, we got to leave it there. Thank you very much, you guys. Thanks, Martha. Good to see all of you tonight. Thanks yeah, so much. Friday. You too. So still ahead, an explosive report says the Obama administration saved the life of a top Iranian terrorist responsible for the deaths of hundreds of our troops. Did they protect him to help secure the Iran deal? The Obama administration is pushing back hard on this idea. They're saying it's not true. Former Navy SEAL Rob O'Neill and Marie Harf, who worked to negotiate that deal, hash it out on the story coming up next.
Yesterday marked a milestone in preventing Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon. Iran has now fulfilled key commitments under the nuclear deal. So it's a disturbing question that has a lot of people, including former Obama administration officials, talking tonight. Did the previous administration save the life of a top Iranian terrorist in order to secure the Iran deal? This is reporting that comes from a Kuwaiti newspaper that suggests that the Obama White House thwarted an attempt by, by the Israelis to assassinate Qassem Soleimani, a notorious warlord responsible for the deaths of hundreds of our troops in Iraq, possibly to curry favor to smooth the path for the deal with Iran. A former Obama spokesperson pushed back hard on this on Twitter yesterday. So what really happened here? Joining me now, Rob O'Neill, the former Navy SEAL who killed Osama bin Laden. He is the author of The Operator and former State Department spokesperson Marie Harf, who was part of the negotiating team that got the Iran deal done. Both are Fox News contributors. Welcome to both of you. Thank uh, you. Good to have you here tonight. Okay. Um, is this a, an issue, Rob, that you ever heard about, thought about, heard people talk about at that time? Yes, this is an issue because for some reason, a lot of it has to do with politics. The former administration really wanted to uh, get a deal with Iran done. They, it seemed to they would stop at nothing, uh, doing anything they could, uh, stopping certain investigations, certain indictments. This thing with uh, Qasem Soleimani is specifically disturbing because the Israelis had a plan to uh, take him out, I think, somewhere near Dam uh, Damascus. And apparently they were tipped off. It's been reported by this um, Iranian newspaper. I talked to my, some of my friends in Washington and in Virginia today, and they, they said, yeah, that's exactly what happened. And if they're willing to protect the guy that's been referred to as the, the Iranian Osama bin Laden simply to get a, a really bad nuclear deal uh, done, with, just, just for the sake of getting a deal done, not a great deal. If it's true, which it will come out that it is, that, um, yeah, I'm disturbed by it. All right. Uh, Rob and others say that they have heard that this was the case, Marie. It's just total fiction, Martha, and there's no evidence that anyone has put forward that shows that this actually happened. A Kuwaiti newspaper, an Iranian newspaper, these are not sources uh, that we would trust to actually have information about uh, what happens in the United States government. Look, I was part of the administration. Yes, we wanted to get an Iran deal done that prevented them from getting a nuclear weapon, but certainly not uh, at any cost, and that never prevented us from going after terrorists, from being very tough on Iran's other behavior. I think there are just times when people don't like the Iran deal, and because of that, they level all of these accusations, but none of them and this one included, are backed up by well, let me actual ask, let me ask evidence. You this. Let, let no me ask you facts this. here. Well, you know, obviously yeah. there was a, an active plan to get Osama bin Laden. Uh, and Rob O'Neill and the, the Navy SEALs that he was with carried that mission out. Was there a plan mm -hmm. of that sort to get Qassem Soleimani in the, during the Obama administration? Because he's, he's been stated as you know, basically having the same equal power in Iran that Osama bin Laden had. Well, those are two very, I would say those are two very different situations. Qasem Soleimani occupies a different space in Iran, and we sanctioned him in the United States using unilateral sanctions. We put a lot of pressure on him and the organization that he leads through a number of different actions, cutting them off from their funding, cutting them off from support, but cutting them off from weapons. responsible for the death of hundreds of, of American so men and, and the military. Took and we took action against him because of that. But to equate him to Osama bin Laden just isn't a factual right, Rob, equivalency. That, it doesn't mean either of them are good. The, the, the way that they're saying about Soleimani is he's got more American blood on his hands than anyone alive other than Ayman al-Zawahiri, who now leads al-Qaeda. <clears throat> and, I mean, President Obama, I was part of a, a couple different missions that President Obama did authorize. The, obviously, the raid for Osama bin Laden, mm -hmm. uh, the rescue of Captain Richard Phillips. But for something, anything involving Iran, he was against. I mean, he, they even went as far as, as, as calling Hezbollah. They went from terror organization to sort of a militia to now like a political party. And we need to get the more mod moderate Hezbollah uh, operative involved with the negotiation, bring the moderate Hezbollah to the, the table. That's, there's something there with the Iran thing, with literally flying in, what was it, $1.7 billion in cash overnight, a cold hard cash to, to release four uh, hostages? I mean, they're that. just shady stuff with Iran, and we're going to find out. Congress is going to find this out. We'll continue to stand well, top Hezbollah of it. Hezbollah continued you. to be designated. Go. Hezbollah was designated the entire time. It remains that way. We never took them off of that list. That's just not true. Marie, thank you very much. Rob, thank you thank as you. well. Thank you. Joining me now, Fred Flights, a former CIA analyst who worked on the Iran nuclear program for 20 years. He's now senior vice president of the Center for Policy Security. Uh, Fred, you're listening to the conversation here. Uh, what's your take? 
Well, Martha, look, I think the president made the wrong decision, but maybe this decision wasn't as bad as, as people think. The nuclear deal is very weak. Iran's behavior got worse. It squandered sanctions relief on terrorism and military spending. The fixes proposed that Congress is putting forward, I think, are very weak and will not fix the deal. And I don't think they're going to be approved by Congress or Europe. But here's something. I'm going to break some news here. This is based on a friend of mine who met with the president in December. The president told my friend when he decertified the deal in October, he never thought Congress would fix it. And I don't think he thinks Congress will ever fix it. So you might ask, why did the president do what he did today? Here's the second thing my friend was told. North Korea is the president's priority. He does not want both situations to blow up simultaneously. I think that that makes a lot of sense, and it makes me feel better about a decision that on the face of it looks very bad. And let me make one final point. I think there are senior officials who are leaving this government over the next 120 days. I think one will be Rex Tillerson, one may be H.R. McMaster, and the president is going to need people who support his Iran policy, hopefully Ambassador John Bolton as national security advisor, to get us out of the deal. So I think that may help us explain what seems to be an inexplicable decision why the president would extend this terrible Iran deal again. Well, I mean, it, it, it's that, that's a fascinating development, if that's the reasoning. He did make it clear that he didn't think he would do it again unless things changed. But it doesn't, as you say, indicate that the Europeans have made any change. The Euro Europeans haven't taken the protests in the streets seriously in Iran at that's all. That's right. Um, you know, so, so what's going to change in the next 120 days? The president really has laid down a marker that he's going to have to stick to if, if nothing else changes on the ground. I think he's going to get out. Europe's not going to change its view. Iran's not going to change its view. Look, in Congress, there's people who want to protect the Iran deal, and there's Republicans who want to kill it. There's no way Congress is going to pass anything. I think the president intends to get out, just not right now. And you think McMaster and Tillerson are gone in what time frame? Well, I think Tillerson's leaving. There were reports this month that, that McMaster may be leaving. My understanding is that the president wants to give everybody a full year in office before they're let go. Uh, McMaster is supposed to give the president his decision by the end of January whether he's going to remain. Mm. But, you know, if the president decided to get out of the deal, he needs senior officials to implement that decision. And that's why I, I think he may want to wait. Fred Flights, thank you very much. Great to have you good, here tonight, good sir. Good to be here. So coming up next, four fraternity members heading behind bars for beating a 19-year-old pledge to death in a horrific hazing ritual. But the fraternity itself is getting hit hard as well. Will this finally stop the senseless deaths on our college campuses? And Tanya Harding back in the news trying to cash in on her infamy, but with dollar signs in her eyes, she has no apologies in her heart for Nancy Kerrigan. As many as six college students lost their lives in the last year in alcohol-fueled hazing rituals. We've covered Tim Piazza's case closely here on this story, and his fraternity brother's fate is still undecided. But now in another similar case, four fraternity members will go to jail in the death of Baruch College freshman Michael Dang. In what could be a pivotal judgment, his now former frat brothers will spend as much as two years behind bars for what they did to him. Trace Gallagher is live in our West Coast newsroom with the backstory tonight. Trace? Martha, this case is being noted as an example of prosecutors now being much more aggressive in pursuing criminal charges in deaths related to hazing. This case is also unique because legally it went after both fraternity members and the fraternity itself, Pi Delta Psi. In December of 2013, Baruch College freshman Chung Deng, who goes by Michael, collapsed after taking part in a ritual called the glass ceiling, a gauntlet meant to represent the plight of Asian Americans where pledges are blindfolded and where a backpack filled with sand while being confronted by fraternity brothers. The grand jury report said Michael Deng was being defiant and resistant and so fraternity members forcefully and repeatedly hit him and knocked him to the ground. In some cases running directly at him with their heads down from 15 feet away. Michael Deng fell unconscious. The fraternity members considered getting an ambulance but thought it would be too expensive. So instead, they changed his clothing and tried to revive him, googling phrases like concussion, can't wake up. 
The 19-year-old died the next day. In all, 37 people faced charges. The four fraternity members facing the most serious charges were all sentenced to between one and two years in prison. And the fraternity itself was banned in Pennsylvania for 10 years. In her ruling, Judge Margarita Patty Worthington called this the most troubling case in her 19 years on the bench. She also noted the dangers of hazing by pointing to a case this program has covered extensively, the death of 19-year-old Tim Piazza, who after a pledge night of drunken partying, fell numerous times, including down a flight of stairs, and never regain consciousness. In the death of Michael Deng, Pi Delta Psi released a statement saying its members feel shame and dishonor that fraternity brothers could be so callous and inhumane. The fraternity is also appealing the judge's decision saying the national chapter should not be conflated with the actions of individuals. Martha. Trace, thank you very much. So there is also new information tonight on the case that Trace just mentioned, the Tim Piazza case. The Pennsylvania Attorney General's Office now taking over the manslaughter case against 12 former members of the Beta Theta Pi fraternity after the former prosecuting attorney claimed that he had a conflict of interest and couldn't go forward with the case. They did not specify what that conflict might be. But the state's attorney general has promised to conduct an independent review now. That review could lead to charges being dropped or increased or changed against all of those individuals. So stay tuned as we follow that. Piazza, as you remember, died in February of 2017. 17 of his so-called brothers have been charged with involuntary manslaughter and tampering with, tampering with evidence originally. Police recovered deleted surveillance video showing Piazza given 18 drinks in under 90 minutes. Later that night, he tumbled down an entire flight of stairs, hitting his head. No one called an ambulance for 11 hours. And hours after her primetime special aired, Hollywood's new darling, Tanya Harding, is experiencing yet another fall from grace. She is firing back at reporters, TV anchors, and now her own publicist for daring to bring up Nancy Kerrigan, a person who knows the whole 1994 saga all too well, is here next. The press threw me to the wolves. Pretty much everybody treated me like I was nothing. Tanya, do you have something to say? No, I'm afraid she doesn't. No, out of my way! Don't touch my truck. I have no comment. You never said to Jeff, let's do this. No. No. He never asked for your permission. No. And you were never part of the planning. No. I did, however, overhear them talking about stuff where, well, maybe we should take somebody out so we can make sure she gets on the team. And I remember telling them, I go, what the hell are you talking about? I can skate. Hmm. Infamous skater Tanya Harding back in the, in the limelight in all her glory in a primetime TV special last night, bringing us all back to 1994 and the attack on Nancy Kerrigan. Why? 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 Boy, who can forget that, right? But now she is reportedly demanding money if journalists want to ask her a question about the attack. In fact, Harding's publicist has just quit claiming her adamant and final position is that reporters must sign an affidavit stating that they won't ask her anything about the past or they will be fined $25,000. Obviously, it doesn't work that way, and therefore I've chosen to terminate our business relationship, he said. Joining us now, journalist Julie Vader, who has covered Harding for years in Oregon. She was there when all of this happened, and she co-authored the book Fire on Ice. Good to see you, uh, Julie. Thanks so much for being with us tonight. Um, I, I saw the movie, I, Tanya, and watched the special last night. And you saw the new movie as well, which uh, stars Margot Robbie as, as Tanya Harding. And you say you didn't like it. Why? Uh, if all I knew about Tanya Harding is what I saw in that movie, I would have total sympathy for yeah. her. But uh, unfortunately, I know her and her story all too well. And the movie badly distorts what actually happened. It's a fictional in what way? Tanya. In what, what do they get wrong? Um, well, so many things, a lot of little movie things, but basically the attack, they veered from what Jeff Galuli and others told the FBI about her involvement. They made it look like 
she didn't know anything, that it had just something to do with some vague letters. And that's quite different from what he told the FBI 24 years ago, that they had discussed killing Nancy Kerrigan or cutting her Achilles tendon or uh, breaking her leg and leaving her duct tape gagged in a hotel room. I mean, really horrific stuff. Of course, if you bring that up in the movie, it doesn't make Tanya look sympathetic at all. So they just yeah. did not do uh, that. Uh, here's a little a run-in she had with Piers Morgan. Watch this. Maybe it suits you to play the victim, but I think the victim in all this wasn't you. It was Nancy Kerrigan, who had her Olympic dream and shattered we, quite literally I, in her legs. I, I believe mean, that we all... Thank you so much. I appreciate being on your show, but I think I'm going to have to say have a good night. And with that, she was she was pretty much gone, Julie. Um, you, you know, I, I think one of the interesting things to me when I watched the movie is the appreciation for her athleticism. You know, I, I think we all remember those days, and we all kind of had the same takeaway when you watch Tanya Harding, except maybe the people who were cheering her on from her own community for very understandable reason the rest of America you know saw her as as the way she was portrayed this sort of you know white trash very tough um, very unlikable in many ways character um, but here's her talking about landing the triple axle which was really the high point of her life whatever made you think that you could do that what makes people think I can't and she does those three and a half revolutions in the air I was like, bam. I was like, yes. And here's one more thing I want to play, Julie. Uh, this is her talking about being abused by her mother. And I want to get your thoughts on all that. I remember she drug me into the bathroom and beat me with a hairbrush. Do you remember the first time he hit you? One that sticks out in my head. We were at the 7-Eleven, and I got nachos. And he said that they would make me fat. And he hit him out of my hand. And then he grabs me and says, let's go, and we go, bam. You know, when you see her mother portrayed in this movie, and then I went back and watched the video of her mother, I, I did feel some sympathy for her. Why, why do you think that there's no, is there no place for that in this story? Oh, there's plenty of place. Um, I wrote extensively about Tanya Harding. Ed Squiff for Sports Illustrated in 1992 wrote a very sympathetic long article about the abuse she suffered in her terrible childhood. Um, it was a great, she was a great story, but that's an explanation, not an excuse. So and we, um, go ahead. the trip, the, if I could talk about the triple Please. axel, I was there in 91, yeah. and I was a sports writer for 15 years and got to see amazing things. I got to see Joe Montana and Michael Jordan and Wayne Gretzky and Greg Luganis. I got to see a lot of great athletes, but seeing her in 1991, triple axel was one of the highlights. It really was genuinely exciting and exhilarating. And it was the highlight of her life. But after that, I, I mean, you know, it's almost like she had, you know, a wish to kind of blow it all up. She stopped rehearsing. She stopped practicing with the same kind of intensity, right? Yes. She had a chance at two Olympics, which is rare for any athlete, and she blew it both times. So what's your takeaway? You know, you, you look at this movie, you see her back on screen. She's at the Golden Globes the other night, soaking the whole thing up at the table. And, you know, everybody's feeling sorry for her and thanking her for her involvement in this. And you think about what happened to Nancy Kerrigan. Um, and I remember one of the biggest lines in the movie to me was when, when Tanya Harding says, I got hit my whole life. She got hit once. Yeah, that was, that was horrific. The screening, the film I saw, the audience burst out laughing. And the two other times Kerrigan was on screen in this movie, she, she was laughed at, uh, which is appalling. I mean, Tanya Harding gets the award for the worst display of sportsmanship ever in sports. And that's what she'll be remembered for, mm -hmm. as well as just squandered talent.